Okay, in this part of the transfer pricing course, we're now getting to the transfer pricing methods. And we're going to basically talk about the five slash six different transfer pricing methods that there are. But before we do that, I'm actually going to take you through profit and loss accounts, delivery of terms, and then we're going to deal with the methods in detail as they are described both in the transfer pricing guidelines from the OECD and in the UN's practical manual. And we'll make sure to work through the examples that they give in both these books so that we can really understand um, which methods are deemed to be applicable when. For those following the audit course, um, Section B of this uh, module or this part of the of the course is uh, about the selection and application of methods, including the function asset and risk analysis, the entity characterization, and available comparables that party to be tested. Actually, <clears throat> as far as the far analysis and the char entity characterization is, is is concerned, the far analysis we've already done in the previous chapter. Um, and the selection and application of methods we're actually going to look at in comparability. So you may want to um, expect that material to be dealt with there um, because it simply belongs better to a, a, um, a comparability analysis, which, will, which are one of, one of the steps which is to, um, to select a transfer pricing method and at that point we will also discuss the party to be tested because it makes a lot more sense okay I want us before we start looking at the methods I want us to understand how a company's profit and loss account typically looks and and this is you know the guidelines and the UN manual do not do this but I think they complicate things by not introducing and discussing a PL first. So that's why we're going to do it here. Um, if you look at a basic profit and loss account, you have at the top, you have your revenue, which is basically your sales, right? And that can be any amount. We'll fill in amounts in a moment. You would then have what it costs you to buy the stuff that you are selling. You would have to deduct the price, of course, and then you get your gross profit. If we go down the line, so revenue minus cost of goods sold gives you your gross profit, right? If you then go and deduct all the costs for running your business, so your selling and your general and your administration expenses, then you get to something called your your operate your your EBITDA, sorry which is your earnings before interest, tax, depreciation, and amortization. We'll talk about those in a minute. And if you then deduct the, the depreciation and amortization, you get to something called your EBIT or your operating profit. So both the gross profit and the operating profit are pretty important um, milestones in the P&L for transfer pricing purposes. If you then go and deduct all your interests and your currency losses and all that kind of stuff, you, you, you get to your EBT, which is your earnings before tax, and then you deduct your tax and you get to your net profit. So this is the basic um, buildup of a profit and loss account. So let us look and see how, um, how the details in the profit and loss account look. First of all, if you look at sales, you take your gross sales. Now, gross sales is basically if you sell to the consumer, that is what the consumer pays you. From that, you typically deduct commissions that you paid others to do the sales for you. You deduct, for instance, excise duties if you're selling alcohol or tobacco or things like that. You deduct supplier shares if they earn part of, 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 of what you sell. You deduct all your sales returns because you thought you made those sales, but actually you didn't. Your product was broken or otherwise insufficient and you had to give the customer back their money. And then you deduct all allowances, discounts, rebates, and things like that. And you end up with your net sales. Okay, so we go from your revenue is basically your net sales, but I'm just showing you how you get from gross sales to net sales. And we'll talk later about comparability. And um, obviously the idea here is if you want to compare your own internal sales 
with that of unrelated parties, you obviously would have to compare either your gross sales to their gross sales, or you would have to compare their net sales to your net sales. But you can't compare your gross sales to their net sales because then you are comparing apples with pears. If you are talking about net sales, you want to be sure that they have also included commissions and sales returns and discounts into that calculation between gross sales and net sales. And they have not, for instance, put commissions and um, discounts into cost of goods sold, where you have them in the difference between your net sales and your grosses. Because again, if they have it under cost of goods sold and you have it under revenue, then you're comparing apples with pears. The next section of the P&L to look at is, is cost of goods sold. And this is basically consisting of two separate parts. The first is inventory. Um, so, you know, you, 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 if, if you have an existing business, by 31 December, hopefully you haven't sold all your stock, but you have some so you can sell in January as well. And that is your beginning inventory. And then you add to that everything that you've bought or produced during the year. So that's a total inventory that you have. And you've got to deduct all the sales and stuff like that. So, so you took stuff out of the inventory. So you look at your final inventory. And if you add the first two and deduct the last one, you get the amount that you spent during the year in inventory, right? So in this particular case, we started with 1,000. We got we, we made 500 more, so we actually had 1,500. But the year end, when we counted our inventory, we only had 1,100. So it meant that we took 400 of that inventory and we actually sold it. So the cost of our inventory is 400. Now, again, if we compare our companies with other companies, we want to be sure that the way we value our inventory is the same, preferably, as they value their inventory, right? Think of the basic inventory valuation methods such as first in, first out, or last in, first out. Yeah? If you have a last in, first out kind of inventory, it means that the latest prices that you bought the stuff for or made the stuff for will predominantly determine the value of your inventory. If you do a first in, first out, you may actually have more historic prices in your inventory than, 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 than later prices. Um, and, 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 you know, if you compare your inventory costs with another party's and you're on LIFO and they're on FIFO and you tend to have stock with long inventory lives and you tend to have prices in general going up, for instance, moving with inflation, then your inventory costs may not be the same as theirs because you are on two different inventory valuation systems. And it'll be something to bear in mind. Other kinds of costs of goods sold can include import duties. Look, I mean, for instance, uh, when we do the re uh, the the, the, um, the revenue, we, we we deal with the excise duties. But for cost of goods sold, we do the import duties. There's no um, particular reason why you wouldn't put export duties under under revenue, for instance. Non-recoverable taxes thing, particularly of VAT, a lot of countries end you up in a situation where um, where because you're not a tax resident and you don't have a PE or subsidiary in that country, you simply don't get the VAT, which they tell you that you have to pay back because you are not a taxpayer. Um, other costs for the cost of goods sold would be the freight cost insurance and handling if you need to ship things to a customer and they expect you to pay for it. Your direct labor costs related to the production. Now this is typically one that well, that could be under cost of goods sold, but it could be further down the line under, under general operational expenses as well. And again, you want to be sure that yours and theirs, your comparables are the same, right? And then you've got other costs for converting materials into finished goods. So this is, for instance, if you buy half products and you convert them into full products. Then you have your cost of goods sold. Now, obviously, you have your gross sales and your net sales of 950. You have your total cost of goods sold here is 500. So it's 400 for inventory and 100 for all kinds of other stuff, leaving you with a gross profit of 450. So what are selling general and admin expenses? 
Selling expenses, for instance, could be advertising. It could be your freight and insurance, your freight that you pay for shipping stuff and the insurance that you pay for, for, for shipping stuff and the handling fees that you pay for shipping stuff. Again, one company may put this under selling expenses. Another may put it on the cost of goods sold. Uh, you, there are differences there. Bad debts is a selling expense. Um, salaries related to sales could be a selling expense. It could also be cost of goods sold, right? And that's how you calculate your selling expenses. Your operating expenses, I'm cheating a bit here, um, would be everything connected with your manufacturing, for instance, if you manufacture. So it'd be your staff doing R&D. It'll be your staff doing production. It'll be your staff doing handling of raw materials or inventory materials. It could be your warehouse costs, all those kind of stuff. And then you've got your admin expenses. Um, and here are a couple of examples, accounting and legal fees, your senior officer salaries, in other words, your management salaries, audit fees, renting office, and your general business insurance. Now, if we deduct all of those from our gross profit, then we get to um, our EBITDA, in this case, 250. And then we deduct depreciation and amortization. The difference between the two being depreciation is when you write down um, physical assets such as buildings and machinery and stuff like that. So typically you buy, let's say, a production machine for a thousand. You expect it to work for about five years um, and you might just then depreciate it to um, zero in five years, which means you will depreciate it 200 every year, right? Alternatively, you could have bought a trademark or you could have bought a business and have goodwill and that you would then not depreciate, but you would amortize. But the same principle applies. You bought, for instance, a business with goodwill um, and you think that the company's customers will probably stay with them for, let's say, five years. And you simply depreciate the goodwill or you amortize the goodwill over, over the five years. And then we come to the operating profit. So gross profit is revenue minus cost of goods sold. Operating profit is gross profits minus uh, SG&A expenses and depreciation and amortization. We then deduct all the extraordinary income and costs and interest and currency results. Typically, you leave out these when you compare yourself to comparables because um, while well, you look at the general way the business is going, you, know, you compare your general business typically with their general business, which is why you would leave out extraordinary income and costs because they are extraordinary. They're not ordinary, right? Um, and interest and, 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 and currency results. Typically, you, you say, you know, if I sell and you sell, how you finance your sales um, to some degree is not that important, which is why we leave out interest costs, although it does come back in, um, in capital intensive businesses. But we'll deal with that later when we talk about um, working capital adjustments. And then we talk about tax and more because of, of uh, uh, professional deformation. I'm just giving here uh, examples of the lines that you see in tax. I mean, you would have the current year tax pay and the current year tax accrued, so then you know what your total tax over the current year is. If we have an EBT of 200 and we're in a 25% tax rate, then typically our tax could be minus 50 if our effective tax equals our nominal tax. Um, and then you would also have your your balance sheet items, either tax accrued or uh, deferred tax due or de deferred tax receivable, um, which you would then have to uh, reduce. Um, and, and, and that it goes beyond the scope of, 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 of this exercise to describe when, when these things are due, but, that, but it has to do with losses carried forward, accelerated depreciation, things like that. And you could also have deferred assets and liabilities, which, which would then be included in the line and you get your total tax line. So now that we've looked at the total P&L, let's look at what a typical production companies, um, production and sales companies P&L would look like. Now, if they were selling goods, right, or even if they're not even producing, they're just selling, they would have all the lines, right? They would have gross sales. They would have cost of goods sold because they buy something to sell. They would have SG&A expenses. They may have depreciation and amortization. If you're a pure sales company, your depreciation might be limited because you're not producing. If you are producing, you will have um, depreciation and everything else, right? And, 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 and transfer pricing is very much about looking at ratios. So for instance, for people selling goods, you might take the gross sales 
and you might look at the gross profit and you would say, well, if I divide my gross profit by my gross sales, my, 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 my gross profit percentage is 45% of my gross sales. And if I want to compare myself to another company to see whether this is more than what other companies make or less than what other companies would make, I would have to take their gross sales um, and their gross profit and divide those and see how comparable we are for a particular transaction, right? The problem comes when you deal with services. Now, if you look at the P&L for services, you're going to have gross sales, but those are going to be the services that you sell, right? So as you can see, the big missing block of data is cost of goods sold. You don't have beginning inventory, you don't have final inventory because you don't keep your services on inventory. You provide the services when they are demanded. Okay, typically, I'm talking typical scenarios here. So if you want to look at ratios, you know, you can look at your gross sales just like you do with selling goods. But if you're going to look at gross profit, your gross profit percentage is always going to be 100% because your cost of goods sold is nothing. Right. So that's not going to be a very reliable, comparable um, ratio. So what you typically do and now we're talking about cost plus is you move down to either, for instance, your EBITDA line or you would move down to your operating profit. Um, whether you do EBITDA or whether you do operating profit may very well depend on how much amortization you have in your P&L. If you just acquired a business and you are writing down Goodwill like crazy, you might not find a lot of other comparable service providers because they may not have acquired businesses and therefore they may not have a lot of balance of, of, of Goodwill on their balance sheet, which they depreciate. If you do it like this, then you can say, well, okay, I made sales for a thousand. I have um, SG&A expenses in this example, 250. So actually I have uh, a, a EBITDA of 750 over a thousand. So my, my, my EBITDA over, over, over uh, gross sales is 75%. And that is pretty profitable. Typically for service providers, obviously the SG&A expenses will be higher because they uh, think of it. If you're selling goods, for instance, you put salaries of people making the stuff to sell the goods into the cogs. If you're a service provider, those salaries would go into your um, your 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 operating expenses. So typically here, the, the the operating expenses will be much higher than they would be for a company selling goods.